Good morning, everyone. Isn't this, isn't this sun extra glorious after yesterday's very dark, rainy, but very much needed day, cold day yesterday? So I'm Sue Merrim, your service leader this morning, and we are so pleased to welcome back the Reverend Peter House this morning. And for any who may not know him, uh, Reverend Peter is a special education teacher and the summer minister for the First Unitarian Church of Rochester. So thank you so very much for making it from Rochester. We're glad to see you. Um, I am, as I said, I'm Sue Merrim and I am joined by Jenny Mumbria on the piano and Andrew Wills on AV. What does AV stand for? Audio oh, thank you. Okay. <laughs> I am so far behind. That's, um, and Louise and Carly are here for our children's program. So welcome members, friends, and visitors to the Unitarian Universalist Church of East Aurora. We're a community that believes our differences make us better a place where all are welcome, regardless of belief systems, ethnicities, gender, race, and sexual orientation. Uh, we are in a safe place. Now, please stand, embody our spirit, and say hello to people around you, even if you've talked to them before the service. <laughs> Now, to all our participants on Zoom, hi, we know you're there, and welcome. Uh, now, are there any announcements this morning? <laughs> Do you have an announcement? I think you're waiting for joys and concerns. Yeah, yes. Jeanette. Yeah, I have an announcement. Um, for those of you who got the directory last year, uh, if you have noticed whether there's any mistakes in your name, address, and serial number, and all that, uh, please make the corrections. I'll have it out here. It's written on a table somewhere. Please find it. And then for those of you who are new and haven't been in the directory, and any of you miss, and what I'd like you to do is write your name and your first name if you have them, your address, email, cell phone, and telephone number, and your birthdays. <laughs> okay, thank you. Social security number two. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> I want to say it so that people listen. Good. Okay. Okay. Hi, everybody. So Jeff wanted me to tell everybody that there are six remaining tickets from the ten that he had for folks who want to attend the Coral Arts on on June eleventh. And for some strange reason, I received another 10 tickets yesterday coming in from, so we actually have quite a few tickets. They are, uh, at least 10 of them are free, so, um, that I got for a gift. So I'd love to be able to extend them to anyone who wants to go up to the Riv, watch a great show. Please just text me or come see me. We've got tickets. Thank you. Sorry. And at the Riv, Hopefully, somebody will play the Wurlitzer organ, which is quite a production on its own. But the concert, we've been to all of the concerts, and they are fabulous. So anyone who wishes to go, please ask Mary for a ticket. Rich. Yes, we uh, have our annual meeting today. Uh, it will convene about 15 minutes after the service ends. And all are welcome, visitors and members alike, but only members can vote. Thanks. Anyone else? Well, in that case, I begin this service by acknowledging that our nation was largely built on the ancestral lands of native nations and the labor of enslaved peoples. May we persevere to achieve a clear understanding of our shared past and utilize these lessons learned for good and for progress. 
Now Jenny will pray the, play the prelude, Love by John Lennon. Will you join with me now uh, as I attempt to light the chalice? Because I'm not very good with these things, but we'll give it a go. And the words are in your order of service. You see? I figured it out earlier. Good. <laughs> We gather this hour as people of faith with joys and sorrows, gifts and needs. We light this beacon of hope, sign of our quest for truth and meaning in celebration of the life we share together. Jenny will now play the opening hymn, uh, if you could stand as you are willing and able, The Morning Hangs a Signal, number 40.
So I, <clears throat> before I start, I just want to say, I think this is the fullest that I have seen this sanctuary since before the pandemic. So it's, it's great to see so many people here in person. It's wonderful if you can Zoom, but there's something about the fellowship of being together in person that I think is really important for a congregation. So it's great to see so many people here this morning. So hard as it is to believe, I've been hearing it for nearly 40 years now. Whenever I meet a new person and they hear that I'm a special ed teacher, they always say, the first thing that always comes out of their mouth is, oh, you must be so patient. It happens so often that I've just come to expect it, that that's what people are going to say. For many years, I would politely disagree. I didn't really think of myself as an especially patient person. After a few years of hearing this, though, I started to reflect on it, and I began to ask my family and friends what they thought. Was I a patient person? Well, the answers that I got from people who knew me well were a bit of a mixed bag. What I mostly got was some version of, yes, you are very patient with other people, but you are not patient at all with things. And this was, and still is, unfortunately true. I do, I can have almost infinite patience with other people. In my job, I can sit with someone day after day after day and teach the same lesson over and over and over. I can patiently correct the same mistakes, explain the same principles, and repeat the same prompts. Things like, remember, Q is the chicken letter. It never goes anywhere without you. <laughs> Little ELA lesson there. I tolerate well being cursed, sworn at, spit at, slapped, kicked. I can weather having my coffee cup picked up and thrown across the room or the bulletin board that I just spent hours on ripped to shreds or being called some really bad names even when it is the same student doing the same things day after day after day after day. And the patience that I have with kids extends to pets as well. I'm not really happy when my new cat digs my chair or wakes me up in the middle of the night. And it really used to try my patience when my dog Ollie would insist on being in charge when we went on a walk. Sometimes I'd have a really short window of time just to take a short walk, but he would insist on going his way anyway. But as the same with my students, I always found the patience that I needed to cope with these small little trials. With things, however, I can be a totally different person. I'm sorry to say, I have virtually no patience for computers that don't respond quickly enough to my commands, cars that won't start, anything that requires me to read a long set of instructions before I can use it, or copiers that jam or won't for whatever reason do what I need them to do when I need them to do it. I have infinite patience with people and animals, but no patience with things. I used to proudly proclaim as if this somehow made me virtuous. I valued living things. I treated them with care and I had the patience to suffer their foibles and their idiosyncrasies. That seemed appropriate and yes, I would guess to say even admirable for someone who is a minister and a special ed teacher. I mean, you definitely want a patient special ed teacher. And as for valuing non-living things, wasn't that just being bourgeois and materialistic? Wasn't it greedy and consumerist to place a value on stuff? I'm pretty sure that my first stepfather, yes, in my life I had two stepfathers, and I'm pretty sure that my first stepfather skewed my perception about this kind of thing a bit. Joe came into my life when I was 13. 
He was essentially a kind and a generous man, and I believe that he truly did do his best to be a good step-parent. But he was materialistic in the extreme. It ruled him, and by extension, it ended up ruling the rest of us too. As soon as he moved in, he set about transforming our house into a show place. New paint, new wallpaper, new rugs, new furniture, and expensive bric-a-brac everywhere you looked. He was a huge fan. I don't know if they do this quite so much anymore, but this is like late 70s, early 80s. He was a huge fan of those limited edition collector's items, those decorative plates and dinner bells and figurines and prints. They only make a certain number of these each year, he'd say, when he'd pull out the certificate that it came with. And this will increase in value, he'd tell us. Someday when your mother and I are gone, you'll get lots of money for them. By the way, I've got some of them now, and I've looked them up, and a lot of them are worth less than he paid for them in 1979. But that's another story. Sadly... However, Joe's love of things was fanatic. It ruled him, and by extension, as I said, it ruled our entire household. Everything, and I do mean everything, had to be completely spotless and in its place at all times. The rugs had to be vacuumed every day, and he looked, the pile of the carpet had to all be going the same way. You couldn't leave, and you couldn't leave any evidence. You know how sometimes you'll vacuum and you'll, you can see the marks from the vacuum cleaner? That had to be eradicated. You couldn't see that the vacuum cleaner had been there. There could never be any drops of water in or around the kitchen sink. And this meant wiping down the entire sink area every time you washed your hands or got a drink of water. If we left our shoes or other items in the wrong place, he threw them in the trash. I can honestly tell you, I was late for school several times searching the trash for shoes or school books or art supplies that had been left in what Joe deemed to be the wrong place. He set aside one room, we always called it this, he set aside one room in the house as the good living room in which he placed the most valuable furniture and bric-a-brac. This room, by his decree, was one that only he and my mother were allowed to enter, and he had louver doors installed to close it off. And he used to tie a thread on the door to see if we went in there when he wasn't home. So keep in mind that this was a home where there were three teenagers, a dog, a cat, and a mother who worked full time. So maintaining housekeeping at a level that met Joe's standards required constant vigilance on everyone's part. The least little infraction, and I mean the least little one, could really literally result in days of punishment. Joe finding water spots on the kitchen sink or a pair of sneakers by the door or, God forbid, discovering that the thread on the louver door had been broken could result in a days-long siege of anger and abuse. Or often, instead of shouting and raging, he'd just go silent or even disappear for a few days after something like finding dust on a windowsill or a scuff mark on the linoleum or some cat fur on a throw pillow. He once disappeared without a trace for three days because as he finally was calm enough to return. He told us when he returned after he was calm enough that he had found a candy bar wrapper on his perfectly cut lawn and none of us had noticed it and picked it up before he came home. And I'm not making any of this up. <laughs> Understandably, spending my teenage years living in this materialistic tyranny had an effect on me. When I first moved out into my own place, as I'm sure everyone can imagine, I reveled, or reveled, I guess is the way to say it, in being able to leave my shoes or my coat or my keys anywhere I wanted to and know that the next morning they would be right where I left them. It was incredibly liberating to use the sink without having to wipe it down afterwards and police it for water spots. 
And if I discovered some dust on my windowsill, I could write my name in it and leave it right there. <laughs> but on a much more profound level, living with Joe had taught me a very valuable lesson about the limits of materialism and the folly of choosing people, and, or choosing things over people, choosing cleanliness over relationships choosing appearances over substance. Perhaps, however, in rejecting this fanatical worship of things, maybe I went a little too far in the other direction, believing that all that mattered was people and animals and values and relationships, and that material objects had little or no value and didn't need to be honored or respected. They were all, after all, just their mere things, right? And so for most of my adult life, I will admit to a tendency to allow myself to behave impatiently and even at times disrespectfully towards things, especially devices that I depend on to serve me like computers and copiers and cars. Perhaps the best example of this tendency is the copier at our school. Well, not just any particular copier because we've had many copiers over the many years I've been there. Now, anyone who has ever had a job in which you depended on a copier to do what you need to do can relate, I'm sure, to the frustration that can result from the copier not doing what you need it to do when you need it to do it. Paper jams, low toner, being out of paper when there's no more paper in sight, the original being the wrong size so it won't copy. All of these minor inconveniences I will admit, can at times make me almost as angry as Joe would get over scuff marks and candy wrappers. Not at people, like Joe, at least, and that's good. Not like that, but I would get very angry at the object itself. And when I'm in these situations, the infinite patience that, I have, patience that I have for children and friends and pets evaporates and I behave more like Joe did when he spotted a water spot on the sink than I do the patient, compassionate teachers, teacher that my students usually saw. And I've been known to spout some comments like, come on, you stupid thing, I haven't got all day, or perhaps the one that I still use too much, uh, this is not going to be a lot of trouble, is it? So think about it. The person who can forgive and hug a child who kicked me in the shin five minutes ago becomes a ranting jerk who lacks the patience to follow the diagram on the screen to locate where the paper jam actually is. You know how to light up and it'll tell you where it is. I have no patience for that. For years, it was even a joke with our school secretary, again, that I had infinite patience with people and no patience for machines. When I was at the copier, she would jump up as soon as it began beeping, understanding that I lacked the patience to troubleshoot even the simplest of problems. And I blissfully told myself that this was fine because after all, the copier is a mere thing. And wasn't I kind and compassionate when it counted with people and living beings? This was just a stupid machine. Wasn't my impatience with an inanimate object a harmless and maybe yes, even a, a bit of an endearing quirk? So as many of you know, the program that I work in is specially designed to meet the needs of students with emotional disturbance. While there are other criteria which are used to reach this diagnosis, kids who fall under this umbrella lack fundamentally the ability to regulate their emotions. Things which non-affected children are able to cope with fairly easily are often crisis points for our kids. Things like having to wait your turn or wait for something for a half an hour, being told no, or perceiving that someone is angry with them can create severe behavioral outbursts that can't be managed in regular education settings, which is why they come to us. So a significant piece of our curriculum, of course, is teaching kids the skills to help them begin to regulate their emotions. A few years ago, we began using a very effective program called Second Step. 
Second step uses simple songs that kids can use when they are angry or frustrated to help them regulate their emotions. The one that is used most often and kind of the first one we introduce them to and encourage them to use is a rap song called Stop, Name Your Feeling, and Calm Down. So it goes, stop and name your feeling, calm down. Stop and name your feeling, calm down. Stop, stop and name your feeling. Turn on your brain. Start thinking, not just feeling. So we, we review it a lot and we have the kids practice it. And it's great, really nice when some of them really start to use it. So many of the kids have learned the song and they have begun to use it when they're about to have a meltdown. So one day, a couple of years ago, I got a lesson from one of my students that helped me see the shortcomings of my people versus things approach to my own emotional regulation or maybe a little bit of dysregulation. So it was the first day of the New York State grades three through eight ELA test, an event that makes everyone anxious every year. Our kids are not great test takers and they are nearly always far behind where the state feels that they should be academically. And like most kids, our students have test anxiety. In our setting, it's compounded by the fact that they usually get a lot of one-to-one -one help and attention from staff whenever they have to attempt something challenging. And on these tests, we can't help at all. In fact, we can be charged with a crime if we are caught helping students. One year, we were actually warned by the state teachers union that New York State had hired retired FBI agents and was planting them in schools to catch teachers who dared to help kids with the test. So it's really serious business. And every year we're read the riot act about all the horrible things that can happen to us if we're caught helping. So needless to say, I think I've set the stage well that everyone is on edge on test day. So this particular test day, on top of everything else that was already stressing everyone out, my nemesis, the copier, chose that morning to malfunction in a few different ways. And after my limited, very limited arsenal of skills to problem solve was exhausted and the machine still didn't work, and a deadline to begin the test was looming, I let my frustration show more than I should have ranting a bit more than was probably appro appropriate to my assistant about what a quote, piece of junk our copier was and suggesting that maybe, just maybe, I might be tempted to pick it up and throw it through the window if I was able to lift it. Thinking back on it, I think I was angrier and more frustrated than I realized and definitely to a degree that my students usually didn't see. So being the empath that I am, I did fairly quickly pick up on the emotions of the kids and the people around me and realized that I was unsettling them. However, before I could say or do anything, Javier, one of my students, one of my, you're not supposed to have favorites, but we all do, one of my favorite students who had really worked hard to internalize the steps of these second step lessons and really in good faith made a regular opportunity to try to use the strategies himself when he was frustrated, said to me, come on, Mr. House, stop, name your feeling, and calm down. <laughs> so I immediately felt exposed and embarrassed. You know the way that only being called out on your behavior by a nine-year-old can do? So he was right, of course. I was letting my emotions get the best of me. And I was setting a bad example for everyone around me, and I wasn't pre-practicing what I regularly preached. But Javier had even more to say. Mr. House, you always get mad at the copier. You shouldn't do that. It can't help it. It's just trying its best. So being the reflective practitioner that I try to be, I did do my best to turn this into a teachable moment in which I acknowledged that Javier was right and that I wasn't practicing what I taught them to do on a regular basis. But later on, after the stress 
of the state test was finally over, I found myself still feeling called out and embarrassed. And perhaps for the first time, I did start to examine and question my people over things at all cost philosophy. My years of proudly boasting that I have infinite patience for people and no patience for things. And while I certainly think that in my life overall, I have struck a much better balance than my stepfather did, perhaps my approach was not quite as virtuous as I had always assumed it was. Maybe among other things, there was a connection between how I treated people and living things and how I treated inanimate objects, things that were just things. My frustration over the copier certainly upset and maybe even frightened my students a little bit. It wasn't the sort of reaction that a gentle, compassionate person has, is it? And maybe our long suffering secretary didn't really find my impatience quite as endearing or amusing as I had always thought and as she had always pretended. Maybe that was just her way of making light of something that might make her a little uncomfortable. So yes, the more I thought and reflected and thought this whole thing through, the more I saw that my habitual impatience with inanimate objects has the potential, among other things, to harm the very people I pride myself on being so patient and loving toward. After all, kindness is kindness. Calm is calm. Gentleness is gentleness. Compassion is compassion. It can't really be compartmentalized or practiced selectively, can it? I believe that we must all strive to bring these qualities to all interactions and all situations, not only for the benefit of others, but also for the sake of our own souls. If we are truly gentle and compassionate people, we are gentle and compassionate with ourselves, aren't we? And allowing ourselves to get angry and testy with things takes a toll on our souls even if there's no one else around to witness our tantrums. Actually, some of my worst times are when nobody is around because I know nobody's watching me, so I really get angry and yell. And sometimes I have been known to give something a little kick or a little punch. But after this initial insight, I began to think more deeply about my connection or perhaps my lack of connection to the physical world, to things, to inanimate objects. There must be a spiritual benefit, I thought, to treating objects as sacred things, much the way I treated living beings. Not certainly a fetishistic attachment to them like my stepfather had, to be sure, not like that. But there must be spiritual value in finding a way of honoring them and appreciating their service to us and giving them the respect they deserve. Because after all, when you think about it, all of the objects that are around us, all the things we use, all the things that serve us, are made from our Earth's very finite resources. And they all represent the creativity of the people who created and invented them, and the toil and effort of the people who make them, ship them, sell them, deliver them, and repair them. So honoring them means honoring all of that human endeavor and all of that sacrifice, including when you take into account that a lot of the things that we make are made by people who are essentially slaves. So a person pours their energy into this object for very little, that's enough right there that should make me want to honor and cherish that object because I'm honoring the person who didn't even have freedom and was just told to make this. And then tied into that, there's the privilege that these objects represent. I mean, think about this. How many people on this planet even have access to a copier or a computer or a car? 
Isn't this alone enough reason to treat them with care and honor and respect? A respect for material objects can also, I think, lead to being less wasteful of the Earth's resources. If we don't value and take care of our things, they're going to wear out more quickly and they're going to need replacing. So I'm starting to come to the realization that everything in this life is sacred. Everything has beauty and purpose and everything deserves respect. And when we treat inanimate objects with a lack of respect, we're not living as spiritual and compassionate and respectful people as much as we can be. So before I finish up, I'm just going to confess I am definitely still working on this. I have definitely not conquered completely my frustration, especially with the copier at school. And I will even confess that I experienced some tech technical glitches preparing for this service. This printer did not want to do what I wanted it to yesterday, and it was really ironic that I was getting frustrated with the computer and the printer as I was preparing this sermon. And yes, I did say at least a couple times to my printer, ah, uh, I hope it's not going to be too much trouble. But then, I promise you, I did catch myself, I stopped, named my feeling, and I calmed down. I invite you to join me now in our closing hymn for all that is our life. Extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again.